Welcome to the video uh, regarding forces between molecules and in solution. And this kind of follows up from what we looked at earlier, the idea that, for example, just even in gases and solids and liquids, that there are some kind of forces that hold molecules together. Not, not bonds, but some sort of attractive forces. So that, for example, I have a solid and I start heating it, the molecules, the atoms start moving faster, they start moving past each other. If I keep heating it, they're turning into gases. And it's, all that's happening is, is the forces can't keep up with the increased motion of the molecule. So it's important for us to get an idea of what the types of intermolecular forces are. That is those between different particles, could be atoms, but, most, but it's mostly molecules. And we're gonna look also at some of the forces in solution that we run into, things that decide whether something's soluble or not soluble in this section. Uh, look at section 6.3 and 6.4 if you want to get a heads up on what this is going to look like. So we say here at the start that the fact that particles condense into liquids and solids requires some sort of an explanation because there isn't a really good <coughs> reason to think to imagine why they might do that. So some of the things that you might look at that are kind of interesting to think about is that even electrically neutral atoms such as helium will actually be attracted to each other to the point where it'll liquefy. Uh, liquid helium is about four kelvins the boiling point of helium. So you have to really, really cool it down. So there can't be much in the way of attractive forces. So you have to get it really cold and really slow to liquefy it. And then it's going to start scattering pretty quickly. And it doesn't when it gets warmer. And down here, uh, second one, atoms of different sizes will condense at different temperatures, with heavier atoms condensing at higher temperatures. If we went down noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, as we go down that, that group, what we find out is that the big heavy radon down there toward the bottom actually is going to be one that's going to have a much higher boiling point than helium will, for example, little lightweight helium will. So the size has something to do with it. Uh, we can also look here at the third point that molecules condense because the attractions of, molecule, of the molecules for each other. And this is not because they form new bonds. We're not forming new covalent complete bonds. We're not changing structures or anything. We just have these particles. They could be atoms, could be molecules, but we have these particles and they get attracted toward each other, not bonding, but attracted toward each other. And then the last point is that even similar sized molecules of different compounds will condense at different temperatures. So even if I have, it's not all size. If I have, uh, if I have uh, chlorine over 71, I have noble gas that's similar, I'm going to find out they're going to have different boiling points, for example. So I can use the boiling point as a good way of thinking about these intramolecular forces. The higher the boiling point, the stronger, more strongly the molecules are attracted to each other, which means the stronger the intramolecular forces are going to be. So what are these intermolecular forces? We're gonna look at three in here, They're called dispersion forces, dipole-dipole interactions, and hydrogen bonding. Those are the three we'll look at in this section and just kind of see where these come from and sort of be able to identify molecules that would have this force or this force or this force in them. So let's take a look then at dispersion forces to start with. This is section 6.3. So what I've got here is I've got a couple of helium atoms. These aren't really how helium atoms look, but they do for this. In the center, right around here, is where I have the nucleus, and I have a little plus charge in there. should be two pluses in there uh, because it's got two protons. And that's a helium atom there and a helium atom there. Now, we know that for a helium atom that, that we have two protons, then we know it also has two electrons. I didn't draw the numbers of things, just the, the fields and <coughs> the charges. <coughs> so when I think about these two atoms in here, they are both electrically neutral. This has a plus two and a minus two. This has a plus two and a minus two. There is no attraction to them because of charge differences. They're going to be the same. But look what happens if these two nuclei start getting close to each other. So if I take a look at here, this one coming over here and this one coming over here, what might happen is as I get closer and closer together, notice down here they've become sort of oblong. And the reason for that, I did draw a couple of electrons here. The reason for that is the electrons are the ones, remember the electrons are pretty mobile. They move all over, all over the place. So I get these helium atoms coming together and I say, oh, wait a minute, look over there. The electrons look over there and say, oh, there's electrons there. We better start running over to the other side because electrons don't like each other. They have the same charge. But once they start running over to the other side, uh, what happens is they can glance back over their shoulder and say, oh, wait a minute, look at now I can see a big nucleus in there. I see a positive nucleus in there. I can be attracted to that. So really it's sort of a temporary thing where it takes and it shifts. Okay, the electron, the electron uh, cloud shifts and allows these two to be attracted even though it's only temporary, even though it's only temporary. These are called dispersion forces. 
one thing to pay attention to, the important part of dispersion force is that they exist between any particles. Ions, molecules, atoms, doesn't matter. It could be polar, nonpolar, doesn't matter. They're going to exist between all of those. So even our poor little helium atom, we have to cool all the way down to 4 Kelvin. It's the dispersion forces that are going to bring them together and form a liquid. Second one, called dipole-dipole. Now, we talked about polar molecules a while back. You know, 16-ish or so, somewhere around there, I think. And in what we looked there at there was that polar molecules have sort of a separation of plus and minus charges. So if I have a polar molecule, as I have this one right here, this is ammonia, and you'll see this is the, there's the plus end of that, there's a negative end up here. It looks like that. So if I have a bunch of ammonia molecules together, what I really have is a bunch of plus charges and minus charges, and they can orient around the plus and minus. Remember, opposite charges attract, likes repel, and they can actually be drawn together. Okay, and so the more polar the molecules are, the bigger the arrow is going to be, the stronger the forces are going to be. And the big thing to notice between the dispersion forces compared to the dipole-dipole forces is dispersion forces happen with everything. <coughs> everything. Dipole-dipole forces only happen with molecules who, who are polar. They have to be a polar molecule in order for this to take place. So in hydrogen bonding, what we're looking at is things, this is a water example. Uh, we like to use water, for example, quite a bit. Here's my oxygen. Here are my hydrogens on this water molecule over here. We know he's polar because oxygen is more electronegative, pulls electrons better than what hydrogen does. So this end of the molecule is negative and this side of it is going to be positive. So when you put these guys and stack them up, what happens really is that the oxygen is so electronegative compared to the hydrogen, it kind of almost weakens that bond a little bit. And what that means now is that this oxygen here can also attract this hydrogen from a different water molecule. This is not a real bond here. That's a dashed line. It's just a force of attraction we have. And hydrogen bond is a very powerful intermolecular force. That's what gives water such a high boiling point. It's very much out of line from what you might expect. And so, so what you have to have to have hydrogen bonding is you have to have a hydrogen atom, that makes sense, bonded to a fluorine, nitrogen, or oxygen has to be bonded to one of those three. If it's bonded to a phosphorus, you don't have hydrogen bonding. Okay, so it's pretty easy to tell. Nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Those are the three, and you'll have hydrogen bonding going on. Positive, oops. So we go to identify, how do we know which molecules have intermolecular forces in them? And a trick to that, it's not a trick, is this. Dispersion forces are present between everything. Molecules of anything have dispersion forces present. Dipole-dipole forces are present only if I have polar molecules. We talked about polar and nonpolar in chapter 16 a little bit. And hydrogen bonding I can have, but I can only have it if I have a hydrogen. That should be obvious. If I don't have hydrogen anywhere, I'm not, I don't have hydrogen bonding going on. But I have to have a hydrogen that has to be bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay? The greater the intermolecular forces are between particles of the substance, the more difficult it's going to be to separate them. So in terms of properties, it means its boiling point goes up and its freezing point goes up. If I have stronger intermolecular forces, my boiling point, my freezing point go up. Okay, And that's, that's kind of a way you can think about how this relates to back to something practical. Now, let's switch over. Those were all pure compounds that we we're looking at and pure elements we we're looking at. Let's switch over now and let's look at what happens in the solution process. We've talked about solutions back in unit 20. <coughs> so now I'm going to take a solute and put it into a solvent. So down here I have a solvent. All those blue particles in there, those are solvent particles in here. They're flowing past each other because they're liquid and all. And over here I have a solute in here. I want to put my solute into my solvent. What you might notice here is that all the molecules over here in the solvent are attracted to each other because of dipole-dipole, dispersion forces, hydrogen binding, whatever it might be is attracting those molecules to each other. In the solute case, all of those molecules are attracted to each other for dipole-dipole, dispersion, hydrogen bonding types of reasons. Okay? The key in making a solution is that the intermolecular forces between the solvent particles have to be similar to those between the solute particles. So for example, if I had a lot of hydrogen bonding going on over here in my solvent, and I don't have any going on with my solute molecules, and it can't contribute hydrogen bonding here, then he's probably not going to go into solution because because whatever this is over here is saying hey look at I got hydrogen bonding you got to do something better than that 
if you want to come in and join me. And so what we find out is that very often the intermolecular forces tell us something about what will dissolve in what. Sometimes you might hear the expression like dissolves like means that polar molecules dissolve other polar molecules and nonpolar dissolve other nonpolar, but polar won't dissolve nonpolar and vice versa. Uh, this is, think of oil and water. Oil and water don't mix. They don't blend very well. That's because water is polar, has hydrogen bonding. Oil is mostly nonpolar. It doesn't have any hydrogen bonding in it. And let's take a quick look at section 6.4. We're going to talk about some ionic types of things here for a moment and, and covalent as well. But it, when we think about sodium chloride in water, so for example, this is the dissolving process of sodium chloride. This is a chloride ion here, and the chloride ions would be the big one, usually green's chloride. Maybe chloride ions here, sodium ion in here, chloride ions, sodium ion is this big stack of ions in here. That's what, a ta that's what a table salt crystal looks like. In order for it to go in solution, here's what has to happen. These are little water molecules. We didn't draw them with the ball form. They just have there's an oxygen here, hydrogen here, hydrogen here. But as these guys come in, if this guy right here, okay, is going to be my chlorine molecule, what you'll see is that the hydrogen sides of the water molecules are attaching themselves to that chlorine atom because of the, the fact that the hydrogens are the positive side of the polar water molecule and the chlorine is the negative ion. They're going to pull them out like that. And the sodium is going to be pulled out by the oxygen because the oxygen is negative and the sodium is positive. So what happens is kind of these guys get torn off one by one, put into solution, surrounded by water molecules, the sodium chloride is going to dissolve. Uh, you might think that thing, factors that come into play is if these ions are held together really, really, really well, it might be difficult to dissolve them. It might be difficult to dissolve them because if I can't get enough energy to pull them out of here, then they're just going to stay together. I kind of always picture this like the movie Ghost where the bad guys die and the little gremlins come and take them away. Think of the water molecules as that in here. They're coming in they're dragging these things off of here. The other thing you might notice is, mentioned earlier in the unit, I think prior to this, that um, solutions of ionic compounds conduct electricity typically. Well, why would that be? What's, what are they doing here? They're taking a stripping away. This is a chloride ion. This is a sodium ion. This is a chloride. These are charged particles. And what's electricity? It's a flow of charged particles. So that means that in these ionic compounds, when they go into solution, they provide ions, which then can carry electricity back and forth. The term electrolytes comes from that. We'll talk about electrolytes in a, in a bit. And that is all of Unit 22. Thank you.